Okay, great. Um, to start off, I would like to uh, say that this work that I'm presenting here today could not uh, exist without the help of my PhD student uh, colleagues, Michael and Rodolfo. Michael's a geophysicist at Imperial College, and uh, Rodolfo is a computer scientist uh, also at Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. So we've already seen a couple of talks talking about uh, automated seismic interpretation and some of the challenges therein, especially regarding uncertainty. Uh, what we're trying to address is a way that we can tackle some of that uncertainty and finding a way to deal with uh, trying to interpret the seismic automatically given all that uncertainty in our data. But let's take a step back and look at some of the challenges that humans have uh, at looking at uh, seismic data. There's been this study by Claire Bond uh, et al. in 2007 where she uh, took a seismic cross-section and she sent that out to four, over 400 participants uh, to label uh, the stratigraphic units present in the seismic image. And it turns out that geologists uh, have quite a difficult time to do that. Uh, it, only about 21% uh, of the professionals got it correct, what the structure should be. Um, and there's various interpretations, especially uh, they have always been biased by their own prior knowledge. So if they have worked in a specific basin, they like to see the features that they typically work on, like salt domes, even though there are no salt domes present, some extensional regime, even though there's no extensional regime present. So really this prior is a dominating term in their own interpretations of seismic data. But what's important to point out is that machine learning can't really interpret in the sense that it's putting meaning to the data. We can only assign labels. And the way that we do that is we build models based on uh, interpretations of these humans. So we have to take that into account when we actually uh, perform this machine learning task. What, others, uh, what other uncertainties do we have in this uh, seismic workflow? Well, I'm sure you know much more about this than I do, but we can start with data acquisition. We might have some ambient noise or even equipment failure. We have to go through data processing. Uh, we have some time to depth conversion and all that contributes to the uncertainty. And finally, someone is going to sit down and try and put some labels onto these images. Where are the salt domes? Where are they delineated? Where do we have truncations and so on? And that really introduces a large degree of bias and potentially uncertainty on these labels. So we have to really make sure that we have also models that can capture that, uh, that challenge. So in general, what types of uncertainty can we distinguish? Not only in seismic data, but this could be a general computer vision task or some data analysis task. Well, there's two different categories. One is so-called aleatoric uncertainty, which is just inherent noise in the data because things happen based on random processes. And so you get uh, fluctuations that you simply cannot explain away with more data. An example of this is shown here on the bottom where you have a semantic segmentation of a street scene and the objects that are very far in the background, uh, I can maybe highlight this here if you see the mouse, no. Nope. It's very far in the background, they are occluded and even if you got more uh, images like this, you would never be able to tell what is actually present there uh, in this uh, far distant background. A second type of uncertainty is so-called epistemic uncertainty, which is really model errors of the models that we build to describe these processes. And they can typically be explained away just by gathering more data and making our models more accurate. But in seismic, we have the problem that we don't have large data sets like in ImageNet, for example, we have small data sets. And getting more data is often very time consuming, uh, costly, and so that's probably not an option to go reshoot every seismic survey we do many times. So we have to make do with the data that we have. So here's a 101 in training uh, neural networks, and we'll start with deterministic neural networks as they've typically been shown today, where in this case you have a two hidden layer neural network uh, and what you want to do is you want to have an input and make a prediction. So you have an input layer and an output which will give you some kind of probability of the thing that you're predicting. Typically the way that you train that is you have a distribution from which you sample the initial set of weights uh, and then you use gradient descent to optimize these weights on the training data that you have and you typically stop when you exceed a certain threshold on your validation set. So when the error becomes worse on on what you're actually trying to predict, the generalization error. But when you test, uh, you simply do a forward pass through the neural network, you use all those connections, and that gives you a single point estimate of your 
uh, model. There is no uncertainty in that. Uh, in general, you can say that you're trying to find the maximum likelihood estimator of your weights uh, given that distribution, if you're familiar with the uh, probabilistic uh, modeling a bit. But we can regularize these networks, and one way to do that is so-called dropout. Uh, so you do the same process, you sample from a distribution, you get some weights, but now you actually uh, drop some connections at uh, training time to regularize the, the network, and it doesn't have the full capacity. But when you test your data and you make predictions, you actually put back all your uh, connections in the network and you have the full capacity making uh, the, the model. This again only gives you point estimates. Now, how do we go to Bayesian neural nets? Well, Bayesian neural nets are quite similar but also a bit different in that sense that now you don't just have a single point estimate on, on the weights, but you actually have a distribution over each neuron. And what you're trying to find is the mean and standard deviation, for example, if you have Gaussians uh, on each neuron. So you need to perform what's called Bayesian inference on these weights, and typically that's intractable, so it's not possible to do that, and you need a way to approximate this process. And one way to do that is actually to do the same process as you've done with dropout training, where you just sample from a distribution, you cancel out some of these connections while you train, but here the important part is that once you actually test on your data, you do that same process. You cancel out some of the connections, and that leads to a various number of uh, models being actually sampled. So you can get many predictions from the same model, and that will give you a measure of the uncertainty uh, on your model's predictions. So every time you test, you make a number of predictions, you average those predictions to get a mean prediction, uh, but you can also take a standard deviation which will give you this uh, measure of uncertainty. So how do we do this for seismic data? Well, we use a similar architecture that has already been shown uh, earlier, we use a convolu fully convolutional neural network that takes in a patch of seismic. Uh, it convolves that through a number of filters, and you have in red these dropout layers which cancel out the connections. And then you have a decoder structure which gives you back a full resolution image, but at each pixel location you have a prediction. Now since this is uh, probabilistic, we do these forward passes a number of times. That's why you can see these many uh, images, and each of them will be slightly different. And then we take the mean, and that gives us our final uh, prediction. But if we take the variance or the standard deviation over those predictions, we end up with an uncertainty at each spatial pixel or at each sample in our uh, seismic cube. So we tried this on the F3 data set because that's been commonly used in other publications. But in our case, we wanted to actually have a, a larger training set, at least in terms of that we don't have correlations between our training and validation set. So we actually labeled five uh, inlines and four cross lines to use them as a training and validation set. Uh, here's just an overview of the different classes that we labeled. Uh, we've got the salt domes, we also have bright spots, which you actually cannot see in this uh, cross section, but we have a number of layered uh, or bedded sediments, including the clinoforms, which we're trying to segment out. So here's one of the validation inlines. So this is not on training data, it's separate data that the network hasn't seen before. On top you can see the input, input amplitudes and the ground truth labels that have been created by Mike, uh, the geologist on our team. Uh, and we assume that that's sort of a gold standard. Of course we can discuss about how uh, gold standard that is, but we have to make do with what we have. And on the bottom right you can see the model's mean and average uh, prediction. But more importantly, you also get an estimate of its uh, uncertainty of the model error at each of these uh, sample locations. And we'll go into what these, what these features actually mean, but you can see that it's not just an even picture. There seems to be uh, higher regions of uncertainty within the model's uh, prediction space. A second example here, where it's quite important that now we'd actually have these bright spots uh, or shallow gas up at the top which you can see in blue as well. And we're nicely picking out these features in our uh, average predictions. But we also see some uh, highlighted uncertainty within, that, uh, within these uh, uh, gas pockets. If we look at that in a bit more detail, uh, what are some of the features that we can see here? Well, one thing that stands out is that there's layers where there's everything blue, which means there's low uncertainty. And probably as a geologist, you don't care too much about these regions here. The model is quite certain. But what about those regions where you have these bright green colors? 
uh, those are probably things where the model is quite uncertain and you might want to go back and see what do these features actually mean? Did I possibly mislabel some features here? Is this a different seismic facies that I should actually characterize? Or it, in this case, we also know that there's some low data quality on the side of the F3, so possibly that plays a role in the model's predictions. And this can really give us an overview of that and regions where we might want to look closer. Uh, in terms of the metrics that we use to, to uh, address the accuracy of our model, we use the intersection over union, if you're familiar with, the, um, with this uh, metric. It's a measure of how these domains actually overlap. So if we look at some of the structures, uh, this is the top salt horizon. You can see in blue <coughs> our training inlines and our uh, validation inlines. It's important to say that this is all in 2D. We don't use 3D data for it, but we can still produce predictions within the cube where we didn't have training data, and that follows nicely um, the structural features such as these normal faults that we have and also the salt dome. Comparing that to the human interpretation on the right side, uh, you can see this is extracted from Petrel. Uh, the interpretation is very close to, uh, to what we have or what we can extract with the neural network. Um, and even there's some regions where possibly Mike wants, might want to go back and see if he maybe missed some uh, parts of that surface. So the model can really give us uh, an accurate overview and also this uncertainty measure. Um, this is just the 3D representation. I'm sure you've seen many of these in Petrel in your daily jobs. Uh, but more importantly, uh, since we have these number of predictions, we can actually sample from our model many realizations of these uh, geological bodies. And here we took this polygonal faulted layer and just created 20 predictions uh, of the whole cube and evaluated what the volume of that polygonal faulted uh, layer is. And you get a distribution over the volume of that layer. In this case, we took the polygonal faulted layer, but this could also be a reservoir, a prospect, or one of these, uh, these gas pockets. And that really allows you to characterize what the variability in the volume of these structures might be. So uh, maybe also to say a bit what did work and what didn't work when we tried this. Um, so we found that these patch-based training methods actually work quite well for these small data sets that we have. And uh, this Bayesian approximation uh, can actually be, should be possible to be applied to any neural network. So you can easily add that to your own models. Uh, what didn't work so well is we tried it on the Malinov data set, uh, but that was uh, quite limited and we quickly overfit. And there's uh, also quite some correlation between the training and validation data. There's been some few uh, addresses of open challenges from AKBP this morning. I think we really need a baseline data set that uh, we can use to compare all these methods. And also we have to take into account how we deal with multiple interpretations because each geologist will have a different view. And uh, sort of we have to agree probably as a community on what standards we want to have and, and what we want to see in a, a benchmark like that. So I think with these conclusions, uh, I'll pretty much uh, end up, well, uh, we looked at two different types of uncertainty. With Bayesian neural networks, you can get an estimate of not just your predictions, but also the uh, model uncertainty at each point in space. And uh, finally, this variance attribute that you get on your predictions really allows you to take that into account on the decision-making process that you have, and possibly where you might want to go back and acquire new labels or relabel your data set and, and see what the influence of those uh, high uncertainty regions are on your uh, decision-making process. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and we're open for questions. Are there any questions for either Lucas or uh, Aina? No? No. Yes. Okay. Oh, there it is. One. Yep. So by putting the dropout back into the, basically doing dropout at, at scoring time, yep. I mean, you don't have any real guarantee that it's going to be a Gaussian distribution or anything like that, right? I mean, uh, how, how do you validate what comes out? Do you just look for like a Gaussian response and what, what the end score uh, distribution is? Or That's a good point. Um, what we, so the aspect there is that you need to calibrate the distribution of the dropout layer 
um, we actually use what's called concrete dropout. So you can, you can modify the weights of dropout uh, during the training process. And there's an additional loss factor that uh, can calibrate the model's own uncertainty. So it's, uh, it's some recent work by Yaren Gall at uh, Cambridge, and uh, it sort of does this calibration process automatically. But there's a Bernoulli distribution on the uh, dropout weights uh, that's assumed. Yeah. Hi, uh, Victor from Sloan Pichet. So, so this is for Aina. So, 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 so your uh, horizon tracking here. So, so using dynamic time warping essentially kind of looks very much like, like dip tracking. You're calculating the local dip in a direction and following it, and such. In the, that way, it reminds a lot about predictive painting, which is done by Sergio Fomel. But I'm thinking a, a problem with that approach is that you might drift away from peak or trough. So, so have you contemplated kind of to having us constraint on kind of that the horizons actually follow the peak or the extrema? Um, well, I, I, I can just speak loud. Um, okay. We don't use a constraint to sort of force it to stay on a peak or trough, but it, I mean, it. I've got one more for the dynamic time warping. So dynamic time warping, usually, I mean, you're giving it a full section. I'm assuming that you're doing it basically like down a trace or something like that is where your labels are and then expanding out from that. So dynamic time warping is usually very sensitive to, um, uh, you know, above or below. So does that really influence the quality of, of the work? Because your norm and depending on your normalization distance uh, function as well. Well, that, that's why we have to do the sequence, um, the seismic sequence, uh, do the boundaries of the seismic sequence first. Okay. To and sort so of crop the, the seismic trace above and below. And that's why we're having issues close to the erosion surface. Okay, so Be you're basically clipping on a top surface and a bottom surface. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. I think we have to close then to present the next one.